The Unshackled Waves, episode 247. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, welcome to another Waves episode. At the just past federal election, there were plenty of minor parties on the right vying for a Senate seat. One of those was Australian Conservatives, founded by former Liberal Senator Cory Bernardi. Despite having a number of high-profile, well-qualified candidates, the party was unsuccessful in having any of its candidates elected. So where to from here, not just for Australian Conservatives, but the fractured right-wing vote in Australia in general? That's the topic of today's show with Ricardo Bossi, who was Sophie York's running mate in the uh, New South Wales Senate for the Australian Conservatives. Ricardo is a motivational speaker and a strategic and operational leader, having been a former Australian Army Special Forces Lieutenant Colonel and advising on defence policy. He is also now a published author with his book, Greatness Awaits You, The Five Pillars of Real Leadership, just released this year. Ricardo, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. Now, you've had an extensive career, including a distinguished uh, military career, uh, which included many overseas postings uh, to the the Middle East. What did that teach you about uh, leadership and about uh, the world and and geopolitics? (laughs) It taught me that uh, the world is a mean and nasty place and it's not like home. Uh, What we have here in Australia is rare. We're we're not the... uh, we're not the norm, we're the aberration. Most of the planet's not like us. And it's it's not uncommon for Australians to think that the rest of the world is like us, but just slightly different color, uh, different language, different food, but it's not. Uh, there's a reason why Australia and Western democracies uh, are the destination of choice for the rest of the world. It's a fantastic place. Uh, it's tough out there, the rest of the planet. They're good people and they're doing it extremely tough. Leadership, what it taught me was that the fundamentals remain the same. The application sometimes varies because of culture, but over time, uh, the fundamentals uh, are always the same because we're all humans. Now, we are raised differently and we believe different things, but there are some uh, fundamental issues within each and every one of us where the right leadership strikes a chord. Now, uh, obviously, you've had uh, life experience and now you're you've gone into political activism and obviously what uh triggered a lot of uh conservative right-leaning people to become involved what what was the the failure of the uh right-wing establishment around about uh, 2016 we had malcolm turnbull as uh prime minister who wasn't seen as a or he's not a conservative and in the 2016 election we saw the return of uh pauline hansen uh over in the uk we saw the the triumph of, of brexit and then of course the election of of donald trump and then in february 2017 uh australian conservatives was born out of this uh disenchantment with the uh liberal party uh what were their failures in your view the the liberal party at that time well it, for my money it started well before turnbull turnbull was just the ugly face of the left actually pushing through uh, conservative politics and conservative life in australia I mean, I was born in 1960, and I remember growing up in the 60s as a child and watching, even then, with a certain amount of, uh, I guess, disgust or concern about what appeared to be childish pushback. I have no problem with with argument, discussion, even rebellion. But it was a a thoughtless, childish pushback that uh, was kicking off. It was becoming evident in the 60s. And it just kept pushing through. Now, conservatives tend to believe there's a a best way to do things. Now, the best way today might be better. There might be another way tomorrow, but there's a best way to do things. And it's stood the test of time. And that's why we're called conservatives, because we know what works and what doesn't. We're happy to try new stuff, but not at a breakneck pace, not without measure. But over the last 40, 50, 60 years, we tend to think, well, we've got it in. We've got on track. We're going the right way. And it's a bit like hiring a plumber. You, you elect a parliament, you expect them to turn up on time, fix the problem and not leave a mess. And we kept trusting somebody else to take care of it. And what we didn't realize was the left has been operating uh, in a subterranean way since the end of World War II. Now, this is easily checked. You can, There's a story I tell about E. Cleon Skousen, a, an FBI agent, 
who penetrated the communist U.S. Communist Party uh, in the 40s and 50s, worked underground there, wrote a book called The Naked Communist. And in that book, he enumerated the 45 goals of the U.S. Communist Party. And the listeners can go Google this after this interview, 45 goals. And if you look at them, the first 10 will refer mainly to uh, the US, but it, it's interesting. But the remainder are very specific and you can tick off each one and see how much the socialist left, the communists, have penetrated uh, Australia and its culture. Now, it's only coming to a head now, but this has been a slow process. They call it the march through the institution. They call it cultural Marxism. That's all correct. But if you look at it carefully, you'll see what they're doing is their goal was to penetrate the unions and big business to get a hold of the uh, the teachers union, get a hold of the school curriculum, uh, disparage traditional families, disparage traditional marriage. And they understand what makes Western civilization work better than we do. And they've been attacking the foundations of it. So this has been a concern for 50, 60 years now very patient, exquisitely executed and designed strategy. Um, Turnbull was just the ugly face of it punching through. They got so arrogant and they began to overreach and they thought we can do anything here. And conservatives are fairly slow to the fight. But once we get in, we can be as brutal as the left. In fact, we can be more so because we're cool, calm and collected about it. And so by the time Turnbull showed his ugly face, uh, there was already a, uh, a groundswell of resentment about what had been happening in politics. Abbott's failure prior to that to stand up, we gave him a big mandate. He he, he refused to take it for a, a walk in the park and he tried to be all things to all men and consequently became nothing to anybody. Now, I like Tony Abbott. I got a lot of respect for the guy, but he failed. And then, as I say, Turnbull turned up and that was just enough. That was just too much for us and it was time to do something different. And that's when the conservatives uh, attempted to uh, to push through for the first time. There were numerous small parties, uh, all pursuing largely the same agenda, but not doing it in a co, uh, you know, in a coalesced form. And uh, and so the uh, the recent outing of this election with the Conservatives and all the parties, Fraser Anning, Pauline Hanson, uh, you know, good numbers for some, appalling numbers for others. As a block, we are the most powerful. But because we are fragmented and the left is more disciplined and you can say dictatorial, um, they got up. Fortunately, the Australian electorate saw Labor for what it was and voted them out. Now, here's the interesting thing, though. That was not a crushing defeat of Labor and it wasn't a glorious win for Scott Morrison and the Conservatives. It was a very close run thing. Now, this is just the first step. Um, conservatives have got a good future ahead of them. I've got some good plans that I'd like to to execute over the next 5, 10, 15 years. So for you, it was more that the conservatives in the major parties had, had failed, like obviously, uh, even after, you know, John Howard, who's considered the, the gold standard of conservatism, there was nothing done about the, the ABC. Multiculturalism was continued to be a, a, a bipartisan uh, policy and uh, all, all of our institutions, such as the the universities and the uh, the, the boards and the councils, were were full of left wing people. Well, that's right. Um, we've got to understand that politicians uh, have very little flexibility. There are five powerful forces that are uh, threatening and running our country, and we can go through them later if you want to. But they can only do what they can do now. Politicians aren't necessarily the, the most courageous individuals on the planet because they owe their place to some favours that they owe other people and they are required to follow orders, just like Scott Morrison uh, is right now. The ABC will never be touched until you get somebody with the courage in there to actually rip the money out of them. Uh, the ABC is a fantastic institution and it should be there to promote Australia, not denigrate it. And that's what it does, because the ABC always attacks from the position of the left and anybody that's not left, they attack. Um, <laughs> they recently were complaining of the AFP raid on their headquarters. Now, what's what I find amusing about that is that just about every journalist and not all, because there are a couple of good ones in there, but just about every journalist in the ABC is a paid partisan hack. They're not journalists, they're not reporters, they're not speaking truth to power. They sit behind a government funded um, paycheck, knowing they'll be protected, and they attack everybody that's not of the left. So for my money, they're not journalists and they don't deserve 
protection that the free press rightly deserves, but they don't deserve it because they are just pay political hacks. They're not free journalists. They're not being truth to power. They're using Australians' money to destroy Australia. Now, whether they're doing that willingly, uh, wittingly or not, I don't know. I can't say. Uh, but the ABC needs to be ripped, uh, ripped apart. Uh, any number of other institutions, the universities, government funding for universities that want to teach destroying Australia should be ripped out as well. You know, you've got the classic case where the Ramsey Centre for Western Civilization couldn't find a home at the ANU, the Australian National University, and yet the ANU accepts money from Qatar and Bahrain, and I think Bahrain, but certainly Qatar and the Emirates, to promote Islam. It's just insanity. I mean, how stupid do you have to be? Now, the politicians can do something about it, but there's only one of four possible ex explanations that are either corrupt, they're imbeciles, they're lazy or incompetent. Because blind Freddy can see what's being done to our country and they are doing nothing about it. They are part of the problem. Yeah, hear, hear. Now, as you mentioned, there's a wide variety of minor parties on the right. You mentioned uh, Pauline Hanson's One Nation and more recent uh, party, Fraser Anning's Conservative uh, Nationals. And uh, there's obviously the, the Shooters, Fishers and Farmers Party. There's a, there's a whole range of parties on the right uh, vying to be the home for, for disenchanted conservatives. Why did you feel that Australian Conservatives was the, the party for you? I'm an ex-liberal, uh, and so I have fairly strong views about wh where the country should be and how it should go. Corey seemed to be the most mainstream approach to solving that problem. The others seemed uh, a little on the periphery. So he was the right way to go as far as I was concerned. And now there was a lot of uh, promise uh, with the, the Australian Conservatives uh, launch. There was the, the merger with uh, Family First. You inherited the, the two Family First MLCs uh, from uh, South Australia. Uh, there were uh, reasonable performances in the, the Benelong and Batman by-election, but uh, uh, Australian Conservatives MLC uh, from uh, South Australia, Robert Brockenshire failed to be re-elected, and then uh, Dennis Hood uh, joined the, the Liberal Party after. You also had Dr. Rachel Carling Jenkins, who defected from the, the DLP, came into Australian Conservatives, but then uh, left. Uh, so the electoral, cons uh, and obviously with the New South Wales state election and the Australian federal election, the electoral performance of Australian Conservatives has been below uh, expectations. And obviously, they, like I could see at polling booths, there was a lot of uh, volunteers, there was a lot of enthusiasm from the, the grassroots. Why was this sort of mismatch but sort of between the, the momentum and the, the volunteers and the eventual result? You know, you're very kind with your choice of words below expectation. <laughs> they were all ignominious defeats, an embarrassment or shocking. It shouldn't have happened. Um, now, I won't go into the detail about the internal machinations of the party, but the short answer is a lack of hard-nosed political competence. That's it. It's as simple as that. You can have the best will in the world. You can have the best policies in the world. You can have the best uh, supporters in the world, which we did without a shadow of a doubt. But there was just a lack of hard-nosed political competence. Um, I, won't, I won't name names or organisations, but there's uh, plenty of blame to go around. The good news is, though, it's easily fixed. I've been, I took a day off after the election. I was a candidate for New South Wales, the Senate. And I think I slept in on the Sunday till 7.30, which for me is a big sleep in. <laughs> and the next morning I was back up you know, at five o'clock getting to plan the next, the next three years because uh, as far as I was concerned, the 2022 election campaign started the day after the, 19, the 2019 election. So I got to work and I, do, I started doing what I do best. I started uh, strategizing and planning and putting together uh, the way ahead for the party. We're speaking to the uh, to the members. There's a lot of enthusiasm out there. The AC membership is very keen to punch on. We're, we're a tough mob. We didn't uh, we didn't cry in our beer. We just said right. We took a we took a pasting. We need to fix it. So I've designed a three phase plan to take uh, to take back the ground that we lost. And we did lose ground because we inherited as the AC. We inherited a lot of disaffected voters who just abandoned us. And I don't blame them to be honest. I I don't blame them one bit. So it's our job now to put together a hard-nosed professional political outfit with a good strategy, well-funded, and we started the day after the last election. And uh, that's the plan that I'm certainly going to go ahead with. We run the ideas past the, uh, the leadership. We adapt and adopt, and away we go. 
The way that I saw it with the election is that Australian Conservatives struggled to be heard over some of the more sort of nationalist and, and bold parties. Is there a, uh, you've talked a bit about uh, what you've got for, for the future of Australian Conservatives, is there uh, an appetite to be a bit more bold and, and outspoken? Oh, without a doubt. And that was one of the big problems that uh, the feedback from just about every member, we're, we're doing a, a next steps tour at the moment, getting feedback. There was no cut through. And there were big issues that would have cut through. And you don't have to be outrageous about it. Just be honest about it. For example, immigration. Immigration is an issue. Stop it. It's just a moratorium. Stop right now. We have no infrastructure. We're running out of water. We have no highways. We have no hospitals to cater for the numbers. So a sensible and attention grabbing uh, policy would have been a moratorium on immigration. Just zero. Just stop. Number two was coal fired power stations. Build them. Lots of them. We should be a powerhouse for energy, coal, gas, nuclear. There's a bold policy that says, you know what, let's get our competitive edge back. Overseas countries can uh, pay their workers next to nothing. What's our competitive advantage? For years, it's been cheap power. That's the way we do it, cheap power. Add to that, here's another one. A conservation policy for the conservatives. We build dams starting from the Tully River in North Queensland and we've managed the flow of water from there all the way down to Adelaide. We put in um, hydro micro uh, turbine power generators. Each one can generate enough electricity for a small town. You put them all the way down and we green central Queensland, we green central New South Wales and even the boaties in the harbours in, in, uh, in Adelaide get water for their boats. Everybody wins, but nobody wants to do it. And here's an interesting thing about that one. The Greens will always tell you, think of the trees, think of the cane toads, think of the frogs. And somebody says it costs too much. And they say, no, no, it's, it's, don't, don't complain about the cost. The only time the Greens complain about the cost is when we say build dams from Tully to Adelaide. And then they say, oh, we can't do it, it's too expensive. That's not true at all. It's utterly achievable. It was designed in 1938 it's by uh, Bradfield, who designed much of Sydney's infrastructure. Um, it's been in, uh, um, improved since then by specialists. It's a great plan and we've got the money for it if we've decided to spend it. And we could solve uh, a genuine uh, environmental disaster that happens year in, year out in central Queensland, central New South Wales. It doesn't have to be that way. We have the solutions, we have the means. So back to your point, policies, cut through policies were easy to do and easy to have, and we should have had them. And we will next time. There'll be a clear differentiation between us and every other party. And here's the point, and here's how it's gonna look. We are for Australia. We are for making this country uh, economically powerful, militarily intimidating, politically free, culturally uh, vibrant and socially cohesive. So there's five metrics by which we want to do things. And we want to unify the country. Because you think about it, you go to an election booth and there's the red shirt for Labour and blue for Liberal and green for green. And, you know, and it's just divisive. Everyone stands for one little pocket. Well, the good thing about the Conservative is we stand dead center in, the, in Australia and everything that's good for the country is what we're for. And we're not against unions, we're for good unions. We're not against business, we're for good business. But everybody's got to live and work together. And that's where the conservatives naturally live. And we were attracting votes from the Labor side and the Liberal side, just sensible people that wanted a good country and to get government off their back and let them get on with their lives. Now, there's been a lot of commentary from uh, conservative media personalities about what the, the next step for Australian conservatives should be. Uh, many have suggested that uh, Cory Bernardi should rejoin the Liberal Party. They've argued that with a conservative in Scott Morrison, now leader of the Liberal Party and uh, prime minister, that uh, the conservatives uh, are no longer required. How do you respond to that? <laughs> yeah, I heard uh, Rita Pahani, Panahi or yeah, Pahani on uh, on Sky say that to Corey. Uh, it's complete nonsense. I couldn't, you couldn't be more wrong, Rita. Um, have a look at Silent Scott Morrison, because there's nothing conservative about Scott, and you know Scott believes in nothing. And people will see this over the next few months. Uh, it's the same rotten Liberal Party that they had before the election. He says nothing about radical Islam. He says nothing about terrorism. He says nothing about female genital mutilation. He says nothing about Sharia law. All of these things are encroaching upon Australia. Nothing about child marriages, which are being accepted, right? 
So these are all straight conservative issues. He says nothing about the distortion of the uh, the school curriculum where children aren't taught how to read, write and add up because our education standards are dropping behind Kazakhstan, but they're taught how to bind their chests and avoid um, their parents' uh, overview when they're going on the internet. They're taught how to tuck their, their, uh, their penises between their legs. And in Victoria, that socialist creation of Dan Andrews, the sexualization of kids is just bizarre. A child can go to their teacher at school and say, you know, today I think I'm a girl. I need I need hormone treatment. And the school can refer that child to a doctor without reference to the parents. Now, this is bizarre. And Scott Morrison is silent. So the federal government is sitting back doing nothing and saying nothing while the country is being ripped apart. So, no, there is plenty of room for conservatives because they have vacated the battle space. And I'll give you one last example, which is quite nobody wants to talk about it. Full term abortion. And this is abortion up to and including the moment of birth. Now think about that for a minute. They like to talk about a clump of cells. You know, the quota girls from the uh, the ALP, Penny Wong and Tanya Plibersek, are members of the group called Emily's List. And Emily's List is a group uh, which supports labor women whose primary role is to get full-term abortion on demand Australia-wide taxpayer funded. It's grotesque. And I won't go into the detail of how they conduct a full-term abortion, but that is not a woman's health issue, it is murder. Now, on a deeper, in a deeper level, if a country can convince its women they are able to kill their babies without uh, any, any pushback, you know, Australia's lost its soul. It really has. I mean, that's just the sickest thing on the planet. And yet that, you know, that silent Scott says nothing about it. Nobody says anything about it. There are plenty of good conservative issues upon which the success of this country was built that we will stand for. So no. And let's say, let's say Corey did go back to the Liberals. Well, good luck, Corey. You're on your own, mate. Because as I said at the state conference, I'm not loyal to a man. I'm not loyal to a party. I'm loyal to a set of principles and a set of values. And those values and principles have stood the test of time. And that's where I'm staying regardless. And I'll be fighting with or without the AC for the next three years to the next election and for the next 10 years to the next three elections and for the next 40 odd years until we win this battle, because this battle is not over and we will win. You call him Silent Scott. It's more like placating Scott, because it seems that or after the, the, the Christchurch uh, mosque massacre, he's remade himself because people think that because Scott Morrison's a devout Christian that oh, he must be really conservative, but he's remade himself as a prime minister for all religions. Uh, he uh, wished everybody a happy end of, of Ramadan. He was pretty silent about things such as safe schools during the uh, election. And even though there's some good pro-lifers in the, the Liberal Party, they're more or less shunned and sort of told to, to shut up about because if you have a look at the the votes in the various state parliaments to liberalize abortion laws they they get through with a lot of liberal party and national party support that's right the the full-term abortion legal in tasmania victoria and queensland and they tried hard and new south had just missed out but he's silent on a whole bunch of th things the censorship of conservative views, for example, the government is facilitating the, sh the, the shutdown of conservative views. They say nothing about uh, Twitter, Facebook, um, Google, distorting answers to questions. They just facilitate it. The, guys, the guy is dangerous for the country. He's Turnbull light. Uh, Shorten would have smashed us immediately. The same will happen under, under Scott Morrison. And I get crankier at the, the alleged uh, conservatives or the alleged Liberal Party. There's an old saying that a certain enemy is better than an uncertain ally. Now, Labor is Labor and the Greens are Green. We know they're, they are bad actors. They really are. They're bad for the country. And they don't pretend to be good. They just, they're just they just there being bad. What weakens the country most is the Liberal Party and its failure to stand up for what it believes in. It sits there pretending to be the force for good, pretending to be conservative, pretending to care for Australia, but they don't. And here's the proof. Here's evidence. They're both as corrupted as each other. Andrew Robb, former federal liberal minister, quits the parliament and goes immediately on an $800,000 a year uh, job with a Chinese corporation with links to the Chinese Communist Party. Slippery Sam Dastayari tips off a Chinese donor and, uh, and he just gets a slap on the wrist. Poor old Sam, you know, he's a good bloke, just made a small mistake. Give me a break. The guy's a federal senator. He should be in jail for treason if he's guilty of it. 
At 22, I had 30 soldiers under my command. And I can tell you, if, if the soldiers cocked up, I cocked it. And as I should, because that's what a leader does. But both sides of parliament, it would appear, in my opinion, that they are heavily in debt to communist China and they are facilitating it. Now, China's a real danger here. I don't blame the Chinese for pursuing Chinese interests. Of course they should, everybody does. But what grinds my gears is when I've got the federal parliament facilitating it. And it gets very subtle. Huawei, the, uh, the Chinese tech giant, is controlling our country. Now, this is a, a bit of a difficult point for some of you listeners to grasp, but I'll make it as simple as I can for you. Imagine the first country with, with uh, rifles and gunpowder when the opposition is playing with bows and arrows and spears. The, you know, the amazing technical advantage. Well, here's a quick quiz for you. What do you think the technical advantage in the next conflict is going to be? It's chips. Until Australia can design and manufacture its own chips, we cannot defend ourselves. We're at the mercy of our adversaries. And the breathtakingly short-sighted individuals that uh, pretend to be our government couldn't even begin to describe the problem. This is a real danger. We are at war. We have been for years. It's been a subtle war. Uh, it's not a hot war nor a cold war. They've been infiltrating our country in as many ways as they can, and they've been succeeding. And like the classic uh, frog in a pot of boiling water, most people are just hoping it'll be okay, but it won't be. We're at war. It's going to take us years to get out of it. And once again, silence got on the liberals, and that's why I get so cranky at the libs, because they pretend to be something they're not. They're like the Judas goat that leads the sheep into the slaughterhouse. And the, the goat never gets slaughtered. He just goes around to draw the next, uh, next mob of sheep in. But that's what the liberals are. And I give a warning right now. I'm out to smash you. You will be destroyed. And if you're lucky, the small rump of conservatives in the Liberal Party might become the junior partner to a conservative government in a few years' time. Oh, that, 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 that's certainly a bold, <laughs> bold promise. Oh, yeah. But it's absolutely doable, too, because once the people realise how badly they have been betrayed by the Liberal Party and the Labor Party, they won't get anywhere near the, 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 the control levers of government ever again. And we've got two battles to fight because it's not just the Liberals. It's the Liberals doing the bidding of China, Islam, the tech, corp the tech giants, uh, socialism and the corporatists. They're the, they're the real threat. Those five threats are what's destroying the country. And they purchase politicians in Canberra and Canberra does their bidding. And they pretend to look after us. They don't. Now, the New South Wales state election, it, it just didn't fail to see Australian Conservatives uh, win a seat, but the, the Christian Democrats, they failed to retain their, their upper house uh, seat for the first time in, in many years. Uh, most of the right-wing minor party vote uh, went to One Nation under Mark Latham's candidacy and the, the Shooters, Fishers and Farmers Party, who got a large rural vote. There seems to be uh, what attracts... Uh, people on the, the right and the, the working class left to minor parties is nationalism as the, the key principle. There's, especially in Europe, there's a resurgence towards uh, nationalism. D uh, could Australian Conservatives be more nationalistic in their, uh, in their message and policies? Well, of course, and that's exactly what we should be doing. We've got to look after our own first. You can't help, you can't help your brother if you can't feed yourself. And what we've got to do is, and again, what I'd like to see the Australian Conservatives do, is um, bring together all the minor parties. Now, we can do this. There are smaller ones that want to merge, and they've already, I've already been in discussion with some parties that are happy to merge, uh, other parties that are happy to be in coalition, with the goal being at the next election, instead of having a dozen minor parties vying for the attention, we have a, a grand coalition of conservative parties cooperating on policy, cooperating on methods, cooperating on the message to make sure that we give genuine conservatives. And there are small C conservatives on the left and small C conservatives on the right of politics. There's this, this great center, this great center in the mass. All they want is sensible policy. They don't want to see us uh, breaking our backs to solve somebody else's problems. Let's look after our own first. There's nothing wrong with that. That's what every family does. You feed your own kids first, and then when you, you, you make enough to, to share with the, the Smith family or some charity, you do so. But you don't feed the kid next door and watch your own child starve, because that's what we're doing here. It's just insane. So yes, the, national, the nationalistic uh, line runs deep. We must, it's just sensible. We must look after ourselves first. We must become strong, so then we're able to help others. And that's what I would like to see more of in this grand coalition of conservative parties, not just in New South Wales, but across the country. 
because I've been in discussions with uh, people in Queensland, Victoria and Western Australia, uh, as well as New South Wales. And there is, a, there is an appetite to cooperate professionally and legitimately to give Australia a chance, not, <laughs> not to get into power. That's not what we want to do. We want to save Australia. And there's a big difference. And as we saw at the the federal election and at the New South Wales state election, uh, it's very difficult for minor parties on the on the right to get elected under optional preferential voting. And that's uh, we saw with the how the the final preferences were distributed that there there wasn't much preference swapping between the the right wing minor parties and the the Senate looks like it'll just be uh, Malcolm Roberts in Queensland and Jackie Lambie in Tasmania. Well, Jackie Lambie, she's sort of running on a Tasmania first a policy. So that's a, sort of a very sort of locally focused uh, campaign. Yeah, it's uh, it's our failure. We blew it. We should have done much better. We didn't. Uh, and I had no problem with Jackie Lambie running a Tasmania first campaign, as she should, because she's a senator for Tasmania. That's what she's supposed to represent. Now, it's funny. People say, you know, they should be uh, governing for all Australians. No, we govern for a set of principles. We don't govern for a bunch of people who want us to give them free stuff. And the best way to do is say, this is what we stand for. If you like it, then that's great, because we're going to do good things with your vote. Um, but we blew it. The the uh, the disparate, disorganised, uncooperative, ego driven right wing parties need to put down their egos, sit down, and nut it out. And that's what we're going to do. Um, that's what we'll do. The next election will be very different, very very different indeed. And both Liberal and Labor have every right to be scared. I give them fair warning. Watch out because you're going to get a pasting. Um, I mentioned the the Christian uh, Democratic Party. Uh, there's been a shakeup recently in that party with uh, Samuel Joshua Gruel and uh, Joel Jamel uh, uh, removing the the uh, state executive. And there's a lot of sort of t turmoil going in there uh, at the moment. And it, it seems that there there needs to be because the the old guard it's sort of well we we can just keep running elections on the on the same thing and they're uh, a lot of the time these these right-wing minor parties they're they're too egotistical to sort of merge and you know give up their their authority and uh, they they sort of want to be a big fish in a small pond yeah the um Fred Nile has done great work for many, many, many years. Unfortunately, it's just got to the point now where it's a combination. This is my understanding of it. It's a combination of some egos, uh, some irregularities in terms of finances and just the survivability of the party. The average age of the party is just short of Methuselah. In a few years, there will be no membership. Um, and so in terms of uh, good governance, primarily, and representing the people, as well as surviving beyond, say, five years, the CDP has to do something. Now, my understanding is uh, both Salma and Joel, the, uh, the approach they took and the actions they took were thoroughly honourable and thoroughly legal as well. It wasn't some short-sighted uh, rush of blood to the head. Very carefully calculated, very um, morally based, small and moral, meaning doing the right thing for the voters, doing the right things for the party. And look, organisations can get too old and they need to be renewed. And so I wish them all the best because that's certainly the CDP is a group that we need to be talking to and cooperating with to start to coalesce this grand coalition of conservatism within the state and within the country and then give uh, the Australians a real difference because right now voting Liberal and Labor, they're both centre left. Well, the Liberal Party is a centre left party. The Labor Party is a left wing party and the Greens are insane. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a good way to to put it. Now, we all agree that Australia significantly dodged a, a bullet in not electing a a shortened uh, Labor Greens uh, government, but we've already gone through why um, we don't have much hope in in Scott Morrison. Uh, where do you see Australian politics go in the in the next three years? It it seems to be that. Uh, Scott Morrison is sort of mainly focused on 
economic management, but the the Labor Party uh, hasn't learnt anything. Shot and blamed uh, uh, vested, powerful vested interests, and you have Anthony Albanese. Uh, well, he's already said, "Oh, we're not going to uh, vote for for any tax cuts. We're not going to accept any of the government's mandates." So you're still going to have a a left which is not going to sort of change its ways, uh, f listen to the to the voters at all. No, I agree. The, 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 uh, my guess is that Albanese is currently trying to keep the various factions of the Labor Party on a reasonable line and the, the factions pulling in their particular direction and arguing the case will settle down after a few months. They'll take a line that they think might win them a few seats. Uh, but it won't be anything attractive for the average Australian at all because they've bought the green dream, which is, which is a hoax. It's a lot you know that the whole global warming thing is nonsense. The Liberal Party has done the same. So the things that hurt Australians most won't change in three years. Scott Morrison is committed to Paris. And, it, and as I think it was Terry McCran wrote quite, quite astutely, well, you can have 0% renewables or 100% renewables. It'll still break the economy and it'll make no difference. So Liberal and Labor on that is just nonsense. And we know in the conservative side of politics, we know that the global warming hoax is a method of just ripping money out of the average Australian's pockets and sending it to mates who are invested in the renewables industry. And it's huge. It's worth big money. So Labor's not going to be attractive. The Liberals haven't got the, uh, how can I say this politely? They haven't got the, the lead in their pencil to shift. And so they're going to win the election. They're going to try to win the election on we're not as bad as Labor because that's how they won the last one. We're not as bad as Labor. So we have a good chance. Once again, I'm, I have no doubt the next three years, what you're going to see is a significant chunk of the parliament, upper and lower house, Senate and House of Reps in conservative hands. And on, on that basis, it'll continue to grow over the next three, four election cycles. And all we have to do is tell the truth. This We need somebody who's going to look after us. As at the beginning, there was Trump, there was Brexit. <clears throat> We've got uh, Salvini in Italy, countries, Poland, Hungary, Czech, they're all pushing hard against the left. And by the left, it is one of five threats. We have to do the same. And we will. And we, all we have to do is tell them the truth. And let me give you an example of the truth and how it'll shift minds. And there's a couple of brutal ways and a couple of nice ways to do it. But I'll get back to the full term abortion thing. In 2009, in Victoria, 42 babies survived the abortion. And they were left to cry and die in a bucket. Now, guess how many there were in 2010? We don't know. know why? Because stop taking statistics. Because they want to lie to the Australian people that their money is being used to kill kids. And they, st they now, the government will make statistics on everything on the planet, bar full-term abortion. But every time I do a talk and I mention that number to people, they are horrified. And I point to them and say, and you are paying for this. All the conservatives need to do is point out the truth of what is going on in health, in the environment, in business, in education, in art, in every aspect of our country. We're being stitched. We're being robbed blind for fools. We tell that story. And uh, we'll get Senate and uh, House of Rep seats the next election and the one after that and the one after that. Well, what showed that anything is possible was the election of Donald Trump in, in 2016. He was able to beat uh, 16 other uh, Republican candidates and then was able to defy the, the polls, the, the, the media, uh, supposed uh, scandals and, and win the, the presidency. And we were told that his presidency was going to be a disaster and that every it, the media were predicting oh, you know, what he said here or, uh, or this scandal here it's going to be at oh, the end of his presidency yet uh two and a half years on uh, the american economy is uh booming and he has a 90 percent approval rating among uh, republicans and his uh, approval rating in general is the highest it's been in 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 two years it's he he's managed to He's never placated the, the left at all. He's never backed down, never uh, apologized, and it's worked for him. And exactly right. See, the, the best summary of Trump, he's done, he's done two things. One, he got elected, and two, he, he kept his promises. Let's get to the first. What the, uh, the mainstream media and the, the, the common commentary didn't understand was, as a, a reporter in the Atlantic Monthly put it beautifully, Trump's supporters took him seriously, but not literally. Trump's critics took him literally, but not seriously. Big mistake. Big mistake. See, the straight, the American electorate knew Trump. They knew who this guy was. He was the New York tycoon, property developer, 
He uh, he did whatever he wanted to do the way he wanted to do it. And that's the American dream. They love Trump. They love that sort of character. Larger than life, take on the world. If you fail, you, you dust yourself off, you get back on, you try again. That's what the Americans love. So they knew him before they even stood. And he smashed conventional mainstream politics because it needed to be smashed. I got warned off. Stop it. Mainstream politics isn't like that in Australia. And in my head, I went, good. In that case, I'll keep doing what I'm doing because the electorate is sick to death of uh, cardboard cutouts of politicians pretending this and pretending that. They need to hear and see the truth. And it can be unvarnished and it can be a bit raw at times, but tough. That's life. So that was the first thing Trump did. He got elected and he got elected because he was known and he got elected because he was different. Then he started delivering on his promises and the the left and even the even the Republicans are going nuts because they hate the bloke. Uh, but Hispanic unemployment lowest ever, black unemployment lowest ever, food stamp usage lowest ever. You know, it's just fantastic. The guy's done a great job. He just broke Mexico. You know, more tariffs until you stop people coming through your country. And Mexico, you know, bravely said, we're not going to do that. Well, he just broke them. And now they're going to start shutting down the, the flow of uh, illegals coming up from the southern border. He's just, uh, and look, <laughs> Trump's fantastic. And I, I dedicated my book to him. And I know we're going to talk about that later. But let me, let me read this to you because there's a quote I found which beautifully summarizes Trump. And that's what people have to understand about um, real leadership. Because Trump himself said, I don't even know what it means to be unpresidential because he got all this criticism. You're not presidential enough. And Trump said, I don't care. You don't need a president. You need somebody to get the job done. And I found this quote, 1952, in an old Encyclopedia Britannica. And listen to this. The heroes of history and poetry may be cruel, violent, self-seeking, self ruthless, intemperate, and unjust. But they were never cowards. They do not falter or give way. They do not despair in the face of almost hopeless odds. They have the strength and stamina to achieve whatever they set their minds and wills to do. They would not be heroes if they were not men of courage. It's the very meaning of heroism, which gives the legendary heroes almost the stature of gods. And that's what Trump is. He's utterly courageous. And courage is the first virtue demanded of leaders. Not wisdom, nothing else just the courage to step up and that's what he's done. And that inspires people, it's visceral, it's real. People can relate to someone taking on a monster, which he's doing every day. They get that because they know the feeling. You know, if you discuss an issue like, uh, we're for freedom of speech, people go, oh, what does that mean? What does that mean? But when they see someone stand up and say, you can go to hell, I'm gonna say what I want and you can take me on if you want, that's different. And that's what Trump did. He showed them by his example which is the best form of leadership, exactly how to take on the monster. And that's what's going to happen here too. We're going to, but the difference is we do not going to have a Trump. We're going to make sure that every Australian has the guts to stand up and to, to politics and politicians say, no, you don't. On your bike, you're out of a job. We're going to put some people in there who can do what we want because your power is derived from us, not the other way around. And we saw what happens uh, when you don't keep your promises in the UK. In 2016, the, the British people voted for, for Brexit. Then Theresa May came in saying, well, I'll deliver Brexit. And she hasn't. She has proposed a pretty awful Brexit deal, which is Brexit <laughs> in name only. And we, we saw the, the European election results where the, the Brexit party came first and the, the major parties, the Conservatives and Labour, uh, were smashed. And now Theresa May is on the on the way out and nigel farage he's saying i i've you know I, I can take on in a general election and become prime minister that's exactly it now theresa may only got the job because her job wasn't to deliver brexit because once again politicians are selected by powerful individuals who want something done and she was allowed to become prime minister uh to slow the whole brexit process down she had no intention of ever delivering Brexit. The whole idea was to delay, delay, delay. It's a, it's a tactic. You trade ground for time. And the idea was they're going to try and have a second election. And the, and the population said, no, you don't. We had an election. Thanks very much. You lost. Because that's what the EU does. And, and it's done it consistently. They did it in Ireland and it's done it many times in its last, in its, in the last five, ten years. They'll hold a referendum. The country says no. And they implement it anyway. But the Brits have had a gutful for a number of reasons and said, no, you don't. Not this time. Now, the French stood up with the, uh, the yellow vest protest. And the Brits have followed suit. And I, did you see the uh, the protests in London where they're cheering Trump. We want Trump. We want Trump. We want Trump. You know, brilliant stuff. They, in France, same thing. 
because he stands up as the example. So May was never in, was never going to deliver Brexit. It was the delaying action. And it's the power behind the politicians. That's what everybody had to realize. Scott Morrison has no power. He's beholden to powerful interests, just like every politician is. Trump's not. That's the difference. Uh, now, uh, I want to talk uh, end by talking about your book, which is uh, Greatness Awaits You, The Five Pillars of Real Leadership. And you've got a copy uh, with you uh, in, fr in front of you. Uh, now, are you able to give a an overview of that? Because it seems that good leaders uh, are very rare. They, they've got to not just be uh, engaging and really good speakers, but they've also got to, it's the internal workings as well, the fact that getting, getting teams together to be in a, in a cohesive way. I wrote the book because I've been in the leadership game for 40 years now, and uh, I've worked with some really good leaders, I've worked with some appalling ones. And most of what I was taught to make sense at the time, but it never really gripped it up sufficiently for me. I, you know, it wasn't comprehensive enough. So that's why I had to write the book myself. And I consult on leadership. That's what I do. And I had uh, a client not long ago. It was a, a professional organization, medical professional organization, very successful, making more money than they could know what to do. It was fantastic. But they needed a, a business continuity plan to make sure they survived the next few years. And one of the three components of that plan that I put together for them was the leadership component. And it's not unusual. They said to me uh, when I said to them initially, what would you like from me? They said, and this was these were the professionals that ran the, the organization, we want you to teach us how to make them, meaning the workers, do what we say. And I smiled because that's invariably what people think leadership's about. And I said, okay, we'll get there eventually, but let's let's go through the model and we'll see how we go. And then I go through the model with them. And I'll describe it to you very briefly and you'll understand there's a theme here. First, there's the foundation. It's like you're building a house. And the, you put down the slab, first of all, the concrete slab. That's the foundation, and that's trust. And trust isn't some vague and woolly concept. It's hard and measurable. And if you follow five simple steps, you'll be trustworthy. But then we talk about the, the five pillars. And the first one is your character. And the second is your capability. Third is your invention. The fourth is their empowerment. The fifth is you. Now, when we go through this with a client, I ask, what do you notice about the five pillars? Four of the five are about you. It's not about them. Let's get you sorted out first. Once you are worthy of uh, leading a team, they will be so attracted to you because you're, you're a good person. You know what you're doing. You come up with the great ideas. You look after them and you know who the hell you are and you turn up every day. So it's all about you. And that's, the, that's what's key about leadership. Get yourself in order first. And then you attract like a magnet, good people that want to work for you and you will repel those that don't. Because it's a lie in life that opposites attract. It's not true. Opposites are vaguely and temporarily fascinated with each other. But anybody that's tried to have a relationship with anybody knows that you need those things in common. And so it's those five pillars, but it's four of the five are about you and how you behave and what you know and what you do. And once you do that, you attract. And that's the best way to lead. That definitely sounds like a, a good strategy. And it seems with leadership, everyone's got an opinion, but you've uh, walked the talk. I mean, they, you've had, like I said, a military career. We've been in leadership uh, positions. So I definitely encourage uh, anyone who's interested in leadership to, to read your book. Uh, where can people get it from? They can either one or two places. Uh, they can go to Wilkinson Publishing. Uh, it's a Melbourne-based publishing firm. Go to their website and you can buy it there. Uh, if they want a signed copy from me, they go to www.lionheartaustralasia.com. That's all one word, lionheartaustralasia.com. Go to the books, um, buy a copy, send me your details, and I'll personally inscribe it for you. Yeah, and I'll leave uh, links to all of that in the, the show notes page. Well, it's been great to chat today, uh, Ricardo, and um, thank you so much for your time to or give a an honest debrief about conservatism post the election. And we'll certainly be watching not just Australian conservatives, but conservative movement in, in general in Australia over the next three years. Thanks very much, Tim. Appreciate the opportunity. And that's the show for today. As I said at the end of this show, we'll continue to cover the latest developments in the Australian conservative movement. Very soon I will have Samyuk Gruel and 
Joel Jamal on this show to discuss their attempts to reform the Christian Democratic Party with the YouTube ad Vocalibs in full swing. It is yet another uncertain time for right-wing news outlets on social media. Make sure you're on free speech social media so you can follow us and other exiled personalities there. We are on gab.ai slash the unshackled. We are also on minds.com slash the underscore unshackled we also have a mewe page at mewe.com slash p slash the unshackled we also have our growing telegram channel on the encrypted messaging service at t.me slash the unshackled we are also on video platform uh, bitshoot uh, but it is blocked by most isps in australia so we're looking up setting up a video account on cocoscope and josh who tv which also support uh, free speech in its entirely remember that we rely on the financial support of you our followers to bring you all the content and interviews that we do you can pledge over at patreon.com slash the unshackled directly via paypal.me slash the unshackled we also have our premium membership option on our website the unshackled.net slash support options slash premium membership thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next show thanks for tuning in to the unshackled waves Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.